Hi, Brother Roy here, Old School Bible Baptist. All right, um, today we're going to look at the question, is Mormonism biblical Christianity? And uh, I have a I have a old, good old friend who was looking into Mormonism, and so uh, I felt led um, to kind of put some stuff together and that might might help him, and of course, uh, it'll be out there on my channel for anybody that's interested in the subject. And let me let me start at the at the very beginning of this, uh, saying that this is in no way, shape, or form an attack on the Mormon people. Because I'm telling you, you look you look around the world, that you you couldn't find a nicer, more family-oriented, moral group of people than the Mormon people. And so this is, this is, this is in no way, shape, or form an attack upon them. Um, th what this is, is an examination of the system, the religious system that they have been caught up in. And they are, they are not the, the villain, they are the victim. Amen. And so we'll uh, we'll we'll look at this thing in a biblical context. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we uh, we love you. We thank you, God, that you gave us your word, that you had your secretaries write it down and you preserved it without error for us today. Uh, Father, thank you that uh, we don't have to wonder what truth is because we have your word on it. And thank you, Lord. There, there's there's there's. Um, there's just no question. We know who you are. We know what salvation is. And we thank you so much for giving us a final authority on these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. So just for opening, um, you know, when, when a person works in a bank and they want them to catch counterfeit bills, they don't show them counterfeit bills. What they do is they make them so familiar with real money that when the counterfeit comes across their hand, they're like, nah, hold on, something's wrong here. Amen. So of course, we don't have the time in this video to uh, uh, do a, a full theological lesson about the Godhead and the deity of Christ and, and and all of that, but let's just let's just touch a couple of real important points. Amen. And first of all, um, when we think about um, Judaism or Christianity, we're talking about monotheism. Amen. In other words, we don't believe in a whole bunch of gods, or even more than one. We believe in one God. Amen. That's that's the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is a one God God. Amen. He is God and no other. He is the creator and no other. Uh, a, a verse a verse that comes to mind on that um, is Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10 and 11. And this is what he says. He said, "Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Amen. God is very specific about that. God is a jealous God. <laughs> his, he will not share his glory with another. There is only one true and living God. Amen. And that's that's what all of Judaism and all of biblical Christianity has believed since the beginning of time. Amen. So now we get to the New Testament and we have some we have some further, further revelation on that. And if you go to John chapter 1 Here's what, here's what God says. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then if you look down in verse 14, 
And it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that was written by John. And you can go, you can go back to uh, um, the book of 1 John, who was written by, written by, also written by John. And you can see in, in 1 John 5, 7, here's what he says. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. These three are one. The book of Colossians says of the Lord Jesus Christ that in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we understand from biblical revelation. And listen, nobody is going to wrap their head and fully understand the Godhead. Amen? Because, I mean, if we could, that means we were smart as him and we're not. But what we do is believe what God has revealed. And God says that there is one God and that that one God eternally exists in three distinct personalities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that those personalities all have one essence. One essence, three persons. One God. One God. This is a New Testament revelation. Amen. So there are not, and that's what's most important as we get begin here, uh, we will reject polytheism and in any of its forms as being more than one God. And so then we know that the Lord Jesus Christ came, and the Lord Jesus Christ came and did something. And we, we can we can read that, uh, uh, and that that is the gospel. Amen. Is what Jesus did. That's what we believe to be saved is the gospel. This is salvation. And look at First Corinthians chapter fifteen. This is what Paul says in revealing what we as Christians. All Christians in, within biblical Christianity. Uh, there's, there's no like only this church or only this denomination. Look, all Christians th throughout all, all, all of church history who have adhered to the truths of this book are in Christ, are part of Christ, are saved. So you can't throw a, a tag on your church and say, oh, we're the only ones that are going to heaven. Everybody else is going to hell. No. Any, it's not about an organization. Salvation is not in a religion. It's not in an organization. Salvation is in a person. That person is the Lord Jesus Christ, and salvation is only in him. Amen? So, and in, in, in here's how Paul explains it so clearly in 1 Corinthians. Listen, he says, uh, he says right here, Moreover, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. The gospel. Okay, what is the gospel? He goes on to tell us. Look at verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that what? Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again. He completed salvation for us. And then the book of Romans, Paul breaks that down as far as how that is preached. Amen? And look at Romans Right here, verse, verse 8, 10, 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The Philippian jailer Fell, fell at the Apostle Paul's feet, and he said, what must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul told him, 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Salvation is in a person. It's not anything you do. It's not anything that, that a church can do for you. Salvation is a personal transaction where you believe and receive what the Lord Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross for you. It's personal. Yet no, no church can give you that. No other person can give you that. You can't earn that. It's personal. So that's just, that's just encapsulated right there that we serve one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. He went to Calvary's cross. He paid for your sins, for my sins, the sins of the whole world. And anyone who will open their heart, believe and receive him personally will be saved. That's salvation. That's the, that's the gospel. That is biblical Christianity, okay? So now that we now that we know what the real money feels like, amen? If you feel that real money, okay. So something that don't feel like the real money, hey, it should send off some bells, whistles, and red lights for you. Amen? Amen. Okay, so here's what, here's what, uh, here's what Joseph Smith uh, comes out and says in uh, Doctrines and Covenants uh, 130. He says, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only true and living church upon the faiths of the whole earth. Okay? That's what Joseph Smith said. He said, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Doctrines and Covenants 130, is the only true and living church upon the face of the earth. And here's, and here's what he said. This is, uh, um, this is in uh, uh, article uh, number... Eight of uh, of Mormon doctrine, Article Number Eight said, and he, the Joseph Smith said, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself told him in His first vision, I was at, I was answered that I must join none of them, any church on earth, for they were all wrong, and the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination. In his sight. So, look, <laughs> we didn't pick this fight, amen. <laughs> That's what Joseph Smith said. Joseph Smith said the Mormon church is the only church, it's the only way, and every other church, the whole body of Christ, the whole Christian faith that had been going on <laughs> for, for 1900 years, it was all corrupt and it was all, abomin and all an abomination in his sight. Okay. All right. Hey. That's your story, Joseph. You know, I'm going to let you stick to it. Amen. Okay, so what is truth? Amen. What is truth? All right. Now, for us as Bible believers, amen, as, as biblical Christians, in, as far as biblical Christianity is concerned, uh, our final authority in all matters in faith of, and doctrine is the Holy Bible. See, and, and the Holy Bible is not just one book. The Holy Bible is 66 books written by 40 men over a period of 16, 1700 years. All right. There are uh, 39 books of the Old Testament and 27 books of the New Testament. And here's the thing about all 66 of these books. They all speak with the same voice, even though they were written over a period of almost 2,000 years, although they were written by 40 different men. Jesus said, my sheep, they hear my voice. They know my, they know my voice, the voice of a stranger. They will not follow. Um, take, for example, if you read at all. Uh, and, and you have a favorite author who is just a fantastic author. Um, when, when, you read, when you read your author, that author has a certain voice. And if somebody else was to try to come along and write a forgery uh, that, you know, and pretend to be that author, if you really knew that author and, and were a fan of that author's work, you'd spot it right away. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, uh, James Patterson uh, wrote a bunch of uh, uh, real good thriller novels uh, back in the day that where they were made into movies and stuff. But then in later years, books started coming out that, was, that said uh, uh, by James Patterson and 
and they would throw some other guy's name in there. And you'd pick, and if you ever read any James Patterson novels, you could pick up one of these books that said, and, and some other guy's name. You could pick that up and start reading it and go, that ain't James Patterson. You know James Patterson's writing, you see. And that's the way the word of God is. Uh, when you've got, you've got all these writers, and all these writers are, are writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the voice you know is the voice of the Spirit of God. It's the voice of the Lord. And that's just coming through all these writers. And when you know him and you know his voice, and then it's, it's just obvious. That's, that's why those 66 books are in the Bible, because anyone with the Spirit of God and, and all, of, all of Christianity down, down through the last 2,000 years, all believers who know that voice have bore witness that this is indeed the Word of God. And th those, those are the books inspired by God, and this is the Bible. And so that's why for, a biblical, for biblical Christianity, our final authority is for us today, the King James Bible. Uh, we would say uh, before the King James Bible came out, it, whatever form that the Bible was in, the Bible, the Word of God, is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Now, let's contrast that with what Joseph Smith and Mormonism says. Joseph Smith and Mormonism, they have, this, is, this is their list of inspired by God final authorities. Divine revelation, they claim, just like we claim for the Bible. They have something called the Book of Mormon. They also have a book called the Doctrines and Covenants. They also have a book called the Pearl of Great Price. Then they also have assembled writings of the prophets, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, put together in, uh, 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 oh, I'm sorry. That Doctrines and Covenants right there is supposed to be, where's my eraser? All right, that, let me just do this. That is supposed to be journals and discourses. All right, journals and discourses. Give me a pass on the old man moment, all right? All right. Journals and Discourses, and these were assembled writings by Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, divine revelations they supposedly received, received, all right? And then finally, when you get all the way down to the bottom, they claim the King James Bible, but uh, again, in Mor Mormon Article of Faith, number eight, uh, the Brigham, Br blah, 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 blah. Joseph Smith said that the King James Bible only insofar as it is correctly translated. Amen? Only in so far as it is correctly translated. And let me let me back up on something too. That when I read uh when I read what Joseph Smith said, uh that uh, Jesus Christ himself told him that uh, um that all the uh all the creeds were an abomination and that all, all the churches were wrong. Uh, I said, uh, I, I said article of faith eight and no, no, that was from his first heavenly vision in Joseph Smith's testimony. I got those two mixed up. So now we come here. This was article of faith number eight. And that is where it says only insofar as it is correctly translated. In other words, <laughs> we'll go with what your Bible says hey, as long as it doesn't contradict any of these other things that we have, <laughs> then the Bible's wrong. Amen? So, yeah, so that, hey, we go by, we go by Book of Mormon, Doctrines of Covenants, Pro of Grace Bias, Journals and Discourses, and the King James Bible as long as it agrees with all of the above. Amen? So that's, that's Mormonism. Okay? So, uh, let's look at let's look at a few things uh, uh, about this Mormonism. Amen. Uh, I'm going to read some stuff, and I'll be reading it from a book which is the definitive work in the field. It's the Kingdom of the Cults. 
by Dr. Walter Martin. Uh, best, best book on cults you'll ever find. Uh, been around over, uh, my, probably 50 years or more. A fantastic, fantastic book. Um, so we'll, we're going to look at some stuff. Uh, we'll go here to page 217. And uh, I couldn't say it any better than Walter Martin. So I'm going to read a little bit. Please don't. Please don't get bored and click off because because th this is this is the information that we're here to receive. This is the this is the stuff. This is the stuff that that we want to know. Amen. So Mormonism, the, La the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Here's here's some quick facts on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Uh, we just went through about the Bible is the Word of God insofar as it is correctly translated. Another one, they say that the Earth is one of several inhabited planets ruled over by gods and goddesses who were at one time humans on other planets. Mormonism is polytheistic at its core. Uh, number three, the Trinity, they say, consists of three gods born in different times and places. The Father begat the Son and the Holy Ghost as spirit children through a goddess wife in heaven. Uh, they say humankind is the same species as God, and God begat all humans in heaven as offsprings of his wife or wife or wives who were sent to earth for their eventual exaltation to godhood. Salvation is resurrection, but exaltation to godhood for eternal life in the celestial heaven must be earned through self-meriting works. Okay, these are just some of the deviations that we'll go into here in a little bit from biblical Christianity. Uh, now, let's look at it, the history, if you will. Uh, where, where did this all start? Where did it come from? The seeds of what was later to become the Mormon religion were incubated in the minds of one Joseph Smith, Jr., uh, the prophet better known to residents of uh, Palmyra, New York, as just plain Joe Smith. Um, born in Sharon, Vermont, uh, December 23rd, 1805, fourth child of Lucy and Joseph Smith, the future Mormon prophet entered the world with the proverbial two strikes against him in the person of his father and his environment. Joseph Smith Sr. was a mystic, a man who spent much of his time digging for imaginary buried treasure. He was particularly addicted to Captain Kidd's legendary hoard. Besides this failing, he sometimes attempted to mint his own money, which at least once brought him into decided conflict with the local constable constables. <laughs> this fact is, of course, well known to any informed student of Mormonism. Um, we go on... Uh, 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 the mother of the future prophet was as much as her husband the product of the era and her environment, given as she was to extreme religious views and beliefs in the most trivial of superstitions. Um, okay, now let's return to the central character of our survey, Joseph Smith Jr. In the year 1820, which proved to be the real beginning of the prophet's call, in that year he was allegedly the recipient of of a marvelous vision in which God the Father and God the Son materialized and spoke to young Smith as he piously prayed in a neighboring wood. The prophet records the incident in great detail in Mormon scripture. Pearl of Grace Pice, uh, Joseph Smith's History 1, 1 through 25, wherein he reveals that two personages took a rather dim view of the Christian church, and for that matter of the world at large, and announced that a restoration of true Christianity was needed, and that he, Joseph Smith Jr., had been chosen to launch the new dispensation. The Mormon church has always held the position that they alone represent true Christianity. Mormon leaders have consistently taught that after the death of the apostles, True Christianity fell into complete apostasy, making it necessary for a restoration. One current LDS apostle uh, gave a speech uh, uh, and where he spoke against the Trinity as one God, labeling the doctrine as apostate, yet he proclaimed Mormonism as restored Christianity. He also revealed that Christians are targeted by Mormon missionaries for proselyting 
due to these apostate differences, which explains why we send missionaries to other Christians. Um, it is interesting to observe that Smith could not have been too much moved by his 1820 heavenly vision, for he shortly took up once again the habit of digging for treasure along with his father and brother, who were determined to unearth treasure, including Captain Kidd's supposed treasures, by means of peep stones, divining rods, or just plain digging. History informs us this the Smith clan never succeeded in these uh, attempts at treasure hunting, but innumerable craters in the Vermont and New York countryside testify to their apparent zeal without knowledge. In later years, the prophet greatly regretted these superstitious expeditions of his youth and even went on record as denying that he ever had been a money digger. Uh, said Prophet Smith on one occasion, in the month of October 1825, I hired with an old gentleman by the name of Josiah Stoll, who lived in uh, New York. He had heard something of a silver mine. Uh, and he goes on, uh, I'll just pass all that. This explanation may suffice to explain the prophet's uh, further, further evidence, in addition to Mrs. Smith's statements, um, that the prophet had been a peepstone enthusiast and treasure digger in his youth, and further, that he also told fortunes and located lost objects by means of a peepstone and uh, alleged supernatural powers, uh, substantiating Joseph's father's account of his rather odd activities in the testimony of the Reg Reverend Dr. John A. Clark after exhaustive research in the Smith's family's own neighborhood. Uh, so we see he was the peep stone gazing was one of several occult practices deemed illegal in the 1820s. Uh, according to Smith's account of the of this revelation that is recorded in the Pearl of Great Price, that would be that in 1820, Joseph Smith claimed a heavenly vision that he said singled him out as the Lord's anointed prophet for this dispensation, though it was not until 1823 with the appearance of the angel Moroni uh, that uh, uh, at his bedside that, that Joe began his relationship with the fabulous golden plates or what was to become the Book of Mormon. According to Smith's account of this extraordinary revelation, which was recorded in the Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith's History 1, 29 through 54, the angel Moroni, the glorified son of one Mormon, the man for whom the famous book of the same name is entitled, appeared beside Joseph's bedside, and thrice repeated his commission to the allegedly awestruck treasure hunter. Smith did not write this account down until some years later, but even that fails to excuse the blunder he made in transmitting the angelic proclamation. This confusion appears in the 1851 edition of Pearl of Great Price. So, uh, what cannot be erased so easily is the original handwritten manuscript history of the church that contains the errors. Uh, in 1827, Smith claimed to receive the golden plates upon which the Book of Mormon is alleged to have been written shortly after this historic find unearthed in the Hill Camorra near, pa near Palmyra, New York. Smith began to translate the reformed Egyptian <laughs> hieroglyphics inscribed thereon by means of the Urim and Thurim, a type of miraculous spectacles with the angel Moroni had the foresight to provide for the budding seer. A uh, whirlwind of contradictory accounts swirled through Smith's early history, particularly concerning his seer stones, first vision, translational work, revelation, and priestly restoration. During the period, Joseph Smith claimed to be translating the plates in Harmony, Pennsylvania, Oliver Cowdery, a school teacher in the neighboring Manchester, New York, had lodged with the Smith family, being a third cousin of Mrs. Smith. He heard about the gold plates and traveled to meet Joseph Smith in Pennsylvania, where he was duly converted to the prophet's religion. 
quite obviously for the purpose of being his scribe in the translation, because they took up the work two days after they met for the first time. Cowdery faithfully wrote down what Joseph said the plates read, although he did not directly observe the translation process due to a curtain that separated them during the translation process. In the course of time, Smith and Cowdery became fast friends, and the progression of the translation and spiritual zeal uh, uh, allegedly uh, attained such heights that in May of 19, 1829, John the Baptist, in person, was speedily dispatched by Peter, James, and John to the humble state of Pennsylvania with orders to confer the Aaronic priesthood on Joe and Oliver. Uh, this amazing event is recorded in the Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith, History 1, 68 and 73. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> in which Oliver baptized Joe, and then Joe baptized Oliver, and they spent time blessing one another and prophesying future events. <laughs> Amen. Uh, from the now hollowed state of Pennsylvania, immortalized by Smith's uh, initiation into the priesthood of Aaron by John the Baptist, Joseph returned shortly to the home of Peter Whitmer in Fayette, New York, where he remained until the translation from the plates was completed and the Book of Mormon published and copyrighted in the year 1830. So following this uh, momentous occasion, <laughs> well, that is when the Mormonism had begun in earnest. Okay, so that's your, uh, that's your history, if you want to buy it, of uh, where this work that we have now, the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's where this supposedly came from. Now, let me read you something from the book. Book of Revelation, right at the very end. The very, very, very end. Revelations 22 and 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy... God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And we see the Apostle Paul say much the same thing in the first chapter of the book of Galatians. Listen, Joseph Smith did not catch God by surprise. Amen? Amen. This is what he says. Paul writing, writing, Paul writing to the church of Galatia. He says, I, am, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven, hello, Maroni. God saw you coming a couple thousand years before you showed up. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Was he serious about that? Read the next verse. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that that ye have received, let him be accursed. So yes, there is another gospel. Not only is there another gospel, there's another Jesus. Amen. Go with me right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Like I said, hey, Joseph Smith and Angel Moroni did not catch God by surprise. We had been fully forewarned in the book about this mess. Here's what Paul says. I would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you unto one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, 
as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Paul said, look, as the devil deceived Eve, what, what is the devil? The devil was, a, was a, a fallen angelic being that appeared to Eve in the garden. And he says, just, just like the devil did with Eve, if anyone comes and tries to present you another Jesus or another spirit or another gospel, what did Paul say over in Galatians? Let him be accursed. Hey, and, and look, look right down here in uh, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And look at verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of of light. Amen. So what I got no I have no doubt at all about this who this supposed Maroni was that appeared to Joseph Smith uh, in the hills outside of Palmyra, New York uh, back then. I have no 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 qualms at all cuz this angel came with another Jesus and another gospel. Let's look at that. Let's look at what the Mormons say about God. Going to go to 272. 272 of the Kingdom of the Cults. And we have some good documentation. Amen. All right. Here's what, here's what Mormons the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, what they say about their Jesus, their God. All right? Okay. We've already talked about our God being one God, the one true only living God. Amen? Which all biblical Christians, regardless of the name of their church or their denomination, we all believe. Amen? In sharp contrast to the revelations of Scripture are the revelations of Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and the succeeding Mormon prophets, so that the reader will have no difficulty understanding what the true Mormon position is concerning the nature of God. The following quotations derived from popular Mormon sources will convey what the Mormons mean when they speak of God. So you got to define your terminology. Just because they say Jesus, hey, we're talking about, hey, describe your Jesus. And they get they get it going. It's like that ain't that ain't the Jesus that revealed Himself in the Holy Bible. You got an you you got an imposter, huh? You've got an imitation Jesus. Amen. So let's let's look at some of this imitation Jesus as presented by the Mormon Church. This is from Joseph Smith, Journal of Discourses, six five. In the beginning, the head of the gods called a council of the gods, and they came together and concocted a plan to create the world and people it. This is from Joseph Smith, Journal of Discourses, 6-3. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man. This is from Doctrines and Covenants, 130-22. The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. The Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses, 7, 238. God exists, and we better strive to be prepared to be one. God's, I'm sorry, God's exist, and we had better strive to be prepared to be one with them. Okay, the gospel through the ages, Prophet Lorenzo Snow. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. Key to the science of theology, partly Pratt. Each of these gods, including Jesus Christ and his Father, being in possession of not merely an organized spirit, 
but a glorious immortal body of flesh and bones. Abraham 4.1, Pearl of Great Price. And then the Lord said, let us go down. And they went down at the beginning, and they, that is, the gods, organized and formed the heavens and the earth. Journal and Discourses, Apostle Orson Hyde, 1, 123. Remember that God, our Heavenly Father, was perhaps once a child and mortal like we ourselves, and rose step by step in the scales of progress in the school of advancement, has moved forward and overcome until he has arrived at the point where he is now. Book of Mormon. Christ was the God, the Father of all things. Behold, I am Jesus Christ. I am the Father and the Son. Look at, listen to this one. This is uh, from Brigham Young, Journals and Discourses. When our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve one of his wives with him. He helped to make and organize the world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. Adam, Adam is our God. Historically, this doctrine of Adam God was hard for even faithful Mormons to believe. Amen. But uh, Brigham Young stated, how much unbelief exists in the minds of the Latter-day Saints in regard to one particular doctrine which I revealed to them and which God revealed to me, namely that Adam is our father and God. I could go on and on. I could go on and on. But... You see what you see where this thing is going. Um, here's something else that Brigham Young said. Brigham Young further declared, "He, Christ, was not begotten of the Holy Ghost. Jesus, our elder brother, was begotten in the flesh." by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden and who is our Father in Heaven, who he just identified as Adam. So he's saying that Adam came down and had sex with the Virgin Mary, and that's where Jesus came from. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. All right. That's, what do they say about Jesus? The record of the Bible concerning the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, is well known to students of Scripture. In Christian theology, there is but one God, and Jesus Christ is His eternal Word made flesh. It is the function of the second person of the Trinity upon His reception by the sons of men to empower them to be the sons of God. And this, and this the Scripture teaches came about as a result of God's unmerited favor and his great love towards a lost race. Now that's the truth. The Lord Jesus offered one eternal sacrifice for all sin, and his salvation comes not by the works of the law or any human works whatsoever, but solely by grace through faith. The Savior of the New Testament, Revelation, existed eternally as God, lived a holy, harmless, and undefiled life, separate from sinners, and knew no sin. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The Savior of Mormonism, however, is an entirely different person. As their official publications clearly reveal, the Mormon Savior is not the second person of the Christian Trinity, since, as we have previously seen, Mormons reject the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. He is not even a careful replica of the New Testament Redeemer. In Mormon theology, Christ is a pre-existent spirit, as it was not only the spirit brother of the devil, as alluded to in the Pearl of Great Price, Moses 4, 1 through 4, and later reaffirmed by Brigham Young in the Journal of Discourses 13, 822, or 8, to me, 282, 
but celebrated his own marriage. Just talking, we're talking about Jesus, the Mormon Jesus here. He celebrated his own marriage to Mary and Martha and the other Mary at Cana of Gal Galilee, where he could see his seed before he was crucified. Before he was crucified. In other words, his children, Jesus' children. That's Apostle Orson Hyde, Journal of Discourses 4, 259. As we have seen previously, the Mormon concept of the virgin birth alone distinguishes their Christ from the Christ of the Bible. In addition to this revolting concept, Brigham Young categorically stated that the sacrifice made upon the cross by Jesus Christ in the form of his own blood was ineffective, ineffective for the cleansing of some sins. Brigham went on to teach the now supposed but never officially repudiated doctrine, suppressed, I'm sorry, and now it's a suppressed but never officially repudiated doctrine of blood atonement. You better understand Young's limitation of the cleansing power of Christ's blood. We shall refer to his own words. That's what Brigham Young said. Suppose you found your brother in bed with your wife and you put a javelin through both of them. You would be justified and they would atone for their sins and be received into the kingdom of God. I would at once do so in such a case and under such circumstances. I have no wife whom I love so well that I would not put a javelin through her heart and I would do it with clean hands. There is not a man or woman who violates the covenants made with their God that will not be required to pay the debt. The blood of Christ will never wipe that out. Your own blood must atone for it. And the judgments of the Almighty will come sooner or later. And every man or woman will have to atone for breaking their covenants. All mankind love themselves and let these principles be known by an individual and he would be glad to have his blood shed. I could refer you to plenty of instances where men have been righteously slain in order to atone for their sins. This is loving our neighbor as ourselves. If he needs help, help him. And if he wants salvation and it is necessary to spill his blood on the earth in order that he may be saved, spill it. Journals of Discourses 3, 2, 47. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Huh? Let me point something else out to you right there. That, that justification of violence and bloodshed on the earth. Now let me, let me, let me put this together for you. Joseph Smith, 1823, on a hill near Manchester, New York. He meets an angel who gives him, what? Another book, another testament of Jesus Christ. And in that thing, <laughs> it tells him he can have all the wives he wants. <laughs> and then go and... And, and they teach that you can shed people's blood to cleanse, to cleanse their sins. Kill them. Slaughter them. That sounds kind of familiar, don't, don't it? Because guess what? In a place called Medina in Saudi Arabia, uh, in around 610 B.C., there was a guy named Muhammad who went up to a place called Mount Hira near Mecca, and there he met an angel in a cave up there. And that angel told him he could have as many wives as he wants <laughs> and 70 virgins in, in paradise. <laughs> and that, that they go out with on their righteous crusade with the edge of the sword, they can cut, cut the in, infidels heads off and shed their blood to spread, the, to spread Allah's kingdom. As I'm here to tell you, Mormonism has a lot more in common with Islam than it does with biblical Christianity. The Bible says, corrupt weights and balances. It says a, a numerous and a variety of weights and balances is abomination to the Lord. They 
a diversity of standards. No, no, we have one standard. huh? Biblical, Christi biblical Christianity has God's revelation, and that's how we know the real money. You get to know, you get to know what God said, and you be, like, like Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, they know me. And when something else comes along, you're going to go, ah, that ain't it, man. That ain't right. That ain't right. Many gods, many, many wives, bloodshed. Uh, I mean, again, not attack on the Mormon people. They're victims. And most, most Mormon people you talk to, they don't even know this stuff. You got to get, I mean, they, their temple ceremonies, their, their, Joseph Smith was, was a Mason. And he was in the levels of, of, the, of the Masonic organization. And you'll find a lot of similarities between Mormonism and the Masonic Lodge. And they have the same things. They, in their temple, they have secret ceremonies. They wear secret underwear. They have secret baptisms. As you get higher, they give you a little bit more of the secret knowledge and the secret knowledge. And only once they really got you by the short and curlies do they start breaking down some, some of the deep, dark, evil wicked, blasphemous stuff of this organization which is not a church, which does not preach the same Jesus as, that who revealed Himself to us in the words of the Holy Bible. It's not a church. It's not our Jesus. There's no salvation in it. And, it, and, and it's unfortunate that all, the, that all the good people that are trapped into it, you know, they're, 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 they're in a dreamy la-la land without salvation, living these good little moral lives and everything's just fine, la-di-da. But you got the wrong Jesus. And Jesus Christ said this, I am the way, not a way, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Listen, he also said this, he said, wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in. But he said, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to eternal life, and few there be that find it. So contrary, contrary to what anyone else may say, it's not like most people are good and they're going to go to heaven, and only few really bad folks are going to go to hell. No, that's not the story. Most people are on their way to hell, and very few will find that narrow way. And that narrow way is the Lord Jesus Christ as revealed in the Word of God and believing the gospel that Christ died for our sins, He was buried, and He rose again the third day, and by faith, believing and receiving that gift, that free gift of salvation paid for on Calvary's cross by the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Listen, no, no religion. But Joseph Smith can't save you. The Mormon church can't save you. Muhammad can't save you. Buddha can't save you. The Pope can't save you. Mary can't save you. Nobody can save you but the one who rose from the dead. You want eternal life? You better go to the one who has it. Listen, when I was, when I was back, in the, back in the dope game, if I wanted some dope, I had to go to the one who had the dope. Amen. If I want eternal life, I got to go to the one who had eternal life. Hmm? And there's only one. There's only one who rose from the dead. A.D., B.C., he split time in half. The Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and he's alive forevermore, and he offers salvation to anyone who will simply open their heart to a loving Savior, and receive and believe Him. That's the simplicity of the gospel. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I don't want to know anything among you, but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is what has redeemed my life. That is what's going to get me into heaven, is knowing Him and the power of His resurrection through His Spirit. Oh, we come not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Amen. God bless the Mormon people. God, God bless everyone who's listening to this. But it is our job. It is our job. The Bible said, beloved, in, in 1 John, he says, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Jesus said that in the end times, before he returns, 
He said that they, uh, the false prophets are going to be everywhere saying, Lo, here is Christ. Lo, here is Christ. And I'm here to tell you, <laughs> he's not in there. But I'll tell you where he is. He's in that old black book, that dear, dear, dear Bible. That's where he is. And you want to know him? You, you get to know him from this book. There ain't no perfect church. There ain't no only church. And only we got salvation. No, salvation is not in a church. It's in a person. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the Jesus Christ of this book. Not the Jesus Christ of that book. I love you. You know that. God bless you.